very briefly introducing the Global Anti-Scam Alliance. I'm the managing director. Sam Rogers uh, is my colleague, uh, our marketing manager. Um, our mission is, is very simple and, and, and I have to say a little bit ambitious, but we want to protect consumers worldwide from online scams. And we do that in, in three ways. We, on a regular basis, about twice a month, uh, we organize meetups like this one, where uh, we share knowledge on the latest scam uh, developments, uh, modus operandi, um, uh, both from law enforcement, consumer protection, uh, governments, as well as researchers and the commercial sector. Goal is really to share uh, uh, knowledge and intelligence on what's happening in the market and uh, um, what can we do to develop uh, together to, to counter online scams better. Um, we also do a lot of research. Uh, we're currently working on our global state of scam report, which we hope to publish around the 1st of October, where we look at more than uh, 30 plus 35 countries and try to determine how much money is being lost in scams, uh, 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 how many people are being scammed, and which best practices exist in, in every country where other countries can learn from to protect their citizens better. And finally, and I will get back to that uh, at the end of our meeting, uh, we organize once per year our Global Anti-Scam Summit, um, where we really meet physically, not only to share information and to network, but also really work together on, better, on finding solutions we can develop jointly to better protect consumers worldwide from scams. Um, I wanted to br uh, briefly uh, highlight the rules of the, this webinar. Uh, Aaron is going to present. Uh, we work according to Shadow House, so you are allowed to use the information Aaron is presenting in your own material. But if you publish, uh, please first contact Aaron and ask for uh, approval uh, before you do. Um, and last but not least, I would like to present Aaron. Uh, Aaron, may I give you the floor and maybe start with introducing yourself? Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. OK, well, thank you for your patience with my tech issues. Uh, I am from I am a prosecutor with Santa Clara County, California. I've been a prosecutor for 25 years and I have the privilege of working with the React team. Go ahead with slide. We are a high uh, high tech enforcement team. We cut our teeth on cryptocurrency. Go ahead with slide slide. Um, when we started prosecuting Sim swappers back in 2018. These were a group of hackers that were taking over your mobile phone service. Go ahead, Georgie. And um, we were we were the first to really get involved with sim swappers and really show the courts that white that, that this type of crime matters. And and to get a sentence of 10 years in a sim swap case was was a major deal with these young people. So. Um, we were delighted that our local bench and our local constituents also saw the importance of holding people accountable. Slide. So um, after that, uh, I want to show you my backyard. I always start with my backyard because I, I am going to tell you about a type of crime that it sounds like you guys were talking a bit about while I was absent. Um, and I always say, because a lot of people will tell me, oh, we don't have crypto crime or we've never heard of it. So I'm going to just tell you about a couple things that happened in my own backyard last summer. And if they're happening in my backyard, I'm sure they are happening in yours. So go ahead, Georgie. Um, so I'm sure that you all have received a, a text um, maybe it's less prevalent outside the US, maybe not, that, that appears to be coming from a wrong number. Slide. Slide. Uh, this is my friend, yeah, perfect. This is my friend Lisa, and she was at my house last summer, and she's all dressed for the 4th of July, and you can see that she is receiving a text, and she thinks it's funny. She's like, look at this person has the wrong number. And uh, I, as soon as this came up, I knew exactly what this was and that this was the first step of, of, of pig butchering. We know that the pig butcherers, these scammers are, are coming to our victims in primarily four ways. One, they are coming to them from um, wrong number, a, a, apparently wrong number texts, and then really from three other major platforms. They are showing up on LinkedIn, they're showing up on Meta, 
and they are showing up on um, on Match.com or dating sites. So we know that that's how they're accessing accessing their victims. Slide. Um, and here's another one. We 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 look at these these specifics of how they are using these wrong number texts because um, what they do is they they're praying these people are masterful. I'm here to tell you that these people are absolutely masterful and they prey on things that people will respond to. Now, we we all care about animals. We most of us care about animals and if we see something like this, we we might respond and say, "Oh, I'm so sorry, you have the wrong number." And that's what begins these conversations. Slide. Uh so back to my backyard. Here's another one that came up last summer. Slide. It was um it was a 3-day weekend and uh, one of my friends, Allison, reached out to me and you can see it's a three day weekend and she's reaching out at 9 p.m. on a Sunday. So she I know that this person needs assistance. And uh, and so she wants to talk about crypto fraud cases. And I can tell before I even begin the conversation with her that this is going to be a pig butchering case because that's what we began to see in great numbers last year. Slide. And I slide. And I knew, go ahead, slide, slide, perfect. I knew <laughs> that before she even started talking, um, that what she was going to tell me, it, she told me it was about her son and that he had been contacted on a dating site by a young, attractive, wo attractive woman, that she had moved the conversation to WhatsApp. And uh, Doug, that's hysterical that you got that same photo. Um, that, that, that she's gonna move the conversation to WhatsApp and then she's gonna spend the next three months or at least a significant period of time cultivating a relationship. And that's what they do. This is a long con. They have time to invest and they're masterful at how they do it. They have specific scripts that apply to um, how you might approach a 30 year old, um, a 30 year old male who is single or how you might approach a 50 year old woman who's recently divorced or even a 65 year old who uh, has just lost his wife. They they it's a psychological scam where they get in your head and they know what buttons to push over a long period of time. And then ultimately, after they've gained your trust, that's when they will begin the conversation about cryptocurrency. Um, next slide. Um, this is just an example of, of their playbook. You can see that um, it's written in Chinese. This is a Chinese scam. It is known as Shazu Pan, and it is it it comes um, it comes to us out of Southeast Asia, and I will t primarily, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Slide. But the way it works is after this long period of time where they are getting to know our victims, and they they are spending that time with two objectives in mind: one, to build an incredible amount of trust to to really come at this relationship as what that victim needs as the perfect relationship. Excuse me, Erin, one moment. Um, can everybody except Erin please mute his microphone? Thank you very much. Erin, please continue. Thank you. Um, and and what they do is they they spend the time learning about that particular victim and they, and how to present as exactly what that victim wants. And over time, they build a trust so that when they ultimately introduce this concept of cryptocurrency, it is coming to the victim in a completely um, trustworthy situation where you really are relying on this relationship that you've built over time. I know for some people it's really difficult to understand how this could happen, but I can tell you that it's not, they don't propose investments in cryptocurrency on day one. What they've done is they've they've spent hours on the phone with in texting these victims, developing a relationship. The second thing they're doing while they're trying to develop that relationship is they're trying to figure out exactly how much the victim has. Because the point of pig butchering, the Shazu Pan, which is directly translated to pig butchering, and the reason why I do like this is because it means it means from snout to tail that they are there to devour that victim completely, that they are not going to rest until they've taken every last cent from that victim. And I also like it because, as I'm about to tell you, this is becoming this is a massive international 
terror. It, this is something that you need to know about and you need to understand the geopolitical issues here because what we are doing essentially is we are moving the world's middle class income into the hands of scammers in Southeast Asia. And we, we need to work together to figure out how we can make that stop. So let's talk about the specific scam. What they do is they get their victims to invest in, if you could go back one, Georgie, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> nope, is, is they, sh they show them a platform that looks like this. Just as masterful as they are in getting the victims to trust them and believe them, they are masterful in presenting something like this that looks real. The victims then start with small investments, 5,000, 10,000, and they see that amount grow in, in a crazy high way. They see, uh, they see their 5,000 move to 7,000, to 10,000, to 12,000, and, and it looks foolproof to them. And they believe it because the person they've been talking to has been showing them a really enviable lifestyle for all this time. The person they've been talking to has been showing them nice cars and nice trips and nice food. And so they believe that this is all possible. So they invest, invest, invest. They are coerced into investing everything. And ultimately, at the end of the day, they will have invested their entire 401k, their entire retirement account, their entire uh, accounts for saving money for college for children. And then slide. And then they will get slammed at the end when they say, OK, I'd like to make the withdrawal. And they will get an email that looks like this, a text that looks like this, where it says, you have to pay 24% in profit tax. And they'll say, okay, we'll take that out of my gains. And the answer is no, you must come up with this in new money. And that's when our victims are uh, taking out second mortgages on their houses, borrowing from their families. And by the end of this entire affair, they are destitute and, and often in situations where they really haven't disclosed all of this to their family to begin with. And they find themselves in a horribly, a horrible position. Slide. Um, so what is happening here? So what we have is we've got a um, a massive, massive, well-organized syndicate operating, I would say collection of syndicates operating in Southeast Asia. Just as masterful as they are in building their victims and, excuse me, and, um, and, and coercing them through a playbook and building these websites, they're also that masterful in, in creating their their talent base. What they're doing is they're putting up websites asking, um, suggesting job opportunities in Bangkok. They are asking for jobs of all kinds, saying that they have jobs in HR or in um, graphic design, even modeling. Um, and that's the secondary part of the victimization here. And, and a, a very significant part of it is that Innocent victims are then applying for these jobs, arriving in Bangkok, having their passports taken from them, and then ending up and being put on a bus and, and moved to a locked compound in generally Cambodia and Myanmar. Now we're seeing Laos and we're seeing some other locations as well. And this is what it looks like inside this compound. You've got a victim sitting, uh, uh, and I'm calling them a victim, the victim scammer who's being uh, required to work there under penalty of violence. We've seen the violent ways they will they will beat them and tase them with electric batons if they don't meet their quotas. This person in front of you has uh, close to 20 phones and a computer and is operating that many conversations. They are working 12 hours a day and they are in these locked compounds where they are not allowed to leave and with bars on their windows and being guarded by people with AK-47s. Next slide. The problem we need to look at here is that they're, they're, this, is, this is no joke, is this is massive and continues to get bigger. So if you look at this, this is KK Park, which is located in Myanmar. If you look across the river, you will see the cell tower that is in Thailand that is um, providing this cellular service that's enabling this work to be done. The compounds you see in front of you with the red roofs, those are thousands and thousands of people working in sweatshop environments doing this massive scamming. And uh, the reason why they are able to get this work done in Myanmar is that it's in a special economic zone. Myanmar carved out locations within their nation where other business could be done 
by other nations. China took advantage, and this is a, a special economic zone that we know to be operated by a Chinese businessman who, um, with all appearances, is well-connected in Chinese organized crime. Next slide. And we see that it just continues to grow. And that's the problem here, is that it is continuing to grow because they are meeting with literally no friction. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what my team has been doing in a, in a minute, but what I can tell you is that what, my, what I'm doing, while significant to my victims, is like throwing eggs at, uh, at skyscrapers and thinking that it's going to make a difference. What, we, what I hope to convey to you is that the scale of this is such that we need to band together to work on this as an international force because because the scale and volume is nothing I've ever seen before. It's massive and incredible. Um, next slide. And this is just an overview of another one of the compounds that um, is, you can, as you can see, there's, con there's construction, there's continued growth, and, um, and little to no friction from the international community into how they are conducting this business. Next slide. Um, this just shows you, like, these are the new developments, the new cell towers, the new crossing and, and bridges. This is coming, uh, this is the, the border between Myanmar and Thailand. What we know about Myanmar at the moment is that they are experiencing a lot of strife in the middle of a civil war and, um, and are having, uh, you can see where the mass amounts of money that is coming into these, these compounds is is going to end up in the hands of um it in some places it it you know they, they are they are paying protectors to make sure that they are safe those protectors are then using that money to buy arms and you can see that what's happening is the money that is being taken from our victims one by one is ending up in the hands of some really evil doers and we need to be very concerned about where that money's going next slide so, um, so there are a lot of NGOs who have started to write about this and to tell us how bad this situation is. This is uh, Jason Tower from the United States Institute of Peace. And what he's telling us is that it, what's happening in Myanmar is something that we should pay attention to. Next slide. And that, um, and essentially the reason why we need to pay attention is because the scale is like nothing we've ever seen before. So when we know that they're stealing billions of dollars, next slide, what we can really quantify that in is we look at what the FBI has reported to us. And the FBI has told us last year that reported to them were $10 billion in online fraud, but specifically $3.3 billion in investment fraud. Now, investment fraud is pig butchering. And we know from working in fraud that um, not everybody reports. And in fact, I get emails all the time. I get dozens and dozens of emails saying my mom is in this scam. I can't convince her that it's a scam or my mom is in this scam and I she doesn't want to report it. We know that AARP will tell you it's something like one in 40 that will report. And this is a different type of crime in that there's such an element of shame and humiliation that they're less likely to report. And they're even further likely to report because the police don't know what to do with this crime. And they're they're fearing that they will be humiliated at the police department. So let's be let's be generous and say that it's three times what what the FBI reported. That's $10 billion. But let's let's be honest and say it's got to be closer to 10 times that. That's $33 billion that has been taken household by household in the United States. And that doesn't include what's been taken from Australia and the UK and other parts of Europe and Japan and all the other nations where this worldwide scam is being perpetrated. Next slide. So when I looked at IC3 last year, I live in California and you can see that we are the big winner here. And um, I love to win, but I sure don't like to win this. And so when I look at this, um, it, it's clear to me that this is, coming from um you know california is uh we are a tech rich environment we have crazy housing prices and so i can see why california would be a good target there's a lot of equity in these homes that they can convince victims to 
rely upon. And actually, that's the new the new trend we're seeing is that they're getting victims to do online home equity lines of credit that can be done in a quick fashion. And I talked to someone last week whose mom, who is Chinese speaking, uh, living in Florida, was big, was lured into a $300,000 equity line of credit with the scammers telling her step by step exactly what to do. So this is the new technique they're using and they they are efficient and they won't stop until they've taken all the money. Next slide. Next slide. So in Santa Clara County, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we have handled this. We heard in we began to work on these types of crimes in March of last year. So it's been about a year and a half. And we heard about a man who had lost a million dollars to pig butchering. Next slide. And there's definitely a very human cost to this. So I'll, I'll give you a minute to take a look at this slide. This is a conversation between my victim, Sai, and his scammer, Jessica. So what you'll see is a is a perfect example of the scammer knowing what buttons to push with Sai, you know, that he, you know, because of your father, I need to support myself. I mean, knowing that Sai is an immigrant, uh, he is supporting siblings, and and then Sai really explains to her the desperation that he will kill himself if this if this doesn't work. And notwithstanding that, the scammers go forward, which just shows what kind of pressure the the scammers must be under. Um, we think many of them are, we think at least half of them are human trafficked. Others are willingly present because the money is so good, but we see what kind of pressure they're under in either way. Next slide. So this is what was happening and continues to happen. This is an article from Wired that says, good luck getting help if you're a victim of, of crypto crime. And in Santa Clara County, we we were not satisfied with that. We were hearing from victim after victim who was losing their entire, everything they had, literally everything they had, uh, calling me in tears. I've, I've never seen the victimization that I've seen with this type of crime. And I've worked in, in law enforcement for over 25 years. This is a huge, different type of crime. And it's a crime that, that truthfully, the world's law enforcement wasn't ready for. Next slide. Um, and victims aren't being heard. Yeah, go through the whole thing. Thank you. These are just some examples of emails that I was getting um, and continue to get where victims are saying, look, I, this happened to me and I've lost a ton of money and I've gone I've gone to all the places that I rely upon. I've gone to all of all of the national law enforcement agencies. I've gone to our local law enforcement agencies and they're not helping me. I need help. I need help. And they're desperate. Next slide. Um, and we we're concerned about these recovery companies, that this is a second way that our victims are getting getting damaged, is that they're so desperate that they reach out to re so-called recovery companies online. And these companies are making promises that they cannot they cannot deliver on. They're uh, they are promising victims they can get money back and um, we in law enforcement know that that's just not possible. And so our victims are being re-victimized. Re Next slide. So what REACT did, oops, sorry, there you go. What REACT did, my team, we said, can we identify and arrest these people in Southeast Asia? No, no. But what we can do and what we learned to do back in our SIM swapping days is we learn how to work with cryptocurrency. We learned how to trace it, how to freeze it, how to seize it and how to get it back to victims. And so that's what we did. And um, and we considered this in terms of, we are a local law enforcement agency who is experiencing a lot of victim strife and what can we individually do? And so this is what we set to do. Next slide. And, uh, and so it got great press. Um, we figured out even though Binance is an international a not US based operation that they were willing to cooperate when it came to pig butchering money and they were willing to honor US subpoenas. And so we sent that subpoena to Binance. 
they honored it and we got we were able to get that money back to our victim so um once that was publicized we then became the top of the funnel for for victims everywhere who just really were having a difficult time getting any kind of attention or any kind of help next slide and so what i saw at that time was um a situation where victims were coming to Santa Clara County, we were able to figure out where their money was going and we were trying to place that victim back with other agencies um, that could help them. And so we would reach out to a, a city in, in the United States and say, hey, we have a victim, we need to talk to someone who can help them get their crypto back. And we were finding that there just were, there, that was not a thing at all, that, that there were a lot of cities and continue to be cities that say, we just are not dealing with crypto. And so my mission became to inspire and educate local and state law enforcement so that they knew how to do this so that they could help their own victims. So I started something called the Crypto Coalition, and it is a group of law enforcement. If you are law enforcement on this call and have not joined, we would love to have you. We started with 85 of us. We do webinars. We have we have a very similar mission to GASA, actually, in terms of educating. And um, I really love some of the some of the promotion, some of the materials GASA has put together because they so align with my own personal mission and what we're trying to do here with regard to scams. And it's unify and and come at this with with all hands on deck. But um, so we started with 85 and today we're over 1200 members. We have webinars. We've had 15 webinars so far and we have people we, where we're teaching the basics. We're we're explaining how to read um, a search warrant return from Binance, how to how to work with Coinbase, what's going on with Bitcoin ATMs, how do we work with them? How do we solve cases like this? Next slide. And what we found was, um, and then click again, um, what we found was that there was a big need for this and there was a lot of interest. And so now that coalition has members from all 50 states and a number of countries around the world. And we, um, I do not see Argentina. Oh, Argentina is on there. We have an Argentinian friend on this call today. Um, but building this international network has been unbelievable and it has enabled us to be able to envision solving crime in places we never thought that we would ever make a connection um we had our colleague from nigeria present to us and a colleague from europol and really in educating about what's possible and how we can really shrink this world when it comes to prosecution of crypto related cases the um, crypto coalition has been fantastic in that regard and then quickly, I just want to tell you, next slide, um, that in addition, I came up with Operation Shamrock, which I think is really aligned to Goss's moves. It's um, education, educate, seize, disrupt. And so the concept there was if Santa Clara County cannot go over to Southeast Asia and make arrests, then what can we do? Slide. And we thought, well, let's educate. Let's educate. Oh, just go back one. Let's educate law enforcement. Uh, on how to do this, let's educate current victims on what they can do. And most importantly, and what I'm really committed to in the next six months is let's it, let's educate potential victims about what's out there and what it means when you get a text like that and why you should never respond and why you should be so wary of anyone reaching out to you um, digitally these days that you do not know. Next slide. Also sees. So um, so how do we how do we do that? Well, we need to get the tracing tools in the hands of um, in the hands of our law enforcement. And I've been working with some of the big tracing companies to work on that. We need financial institutions to cooperate better. And I say clearinghouse. But what I mean by that is we need a better um, international reporting system where victims can report and get themselves in in front of a, a competent investigator quickly, because we all know that speed is the issue here. Next slide. And then we need to disrupt. We need to disrupt this operation. You know, I showed you that picture of that um, of that cell tower. That's part of the infrastructure that we should be working on taking down. We should talk to Thailand about how we can make that happen. We should, I've been working on the on-ramps and by that I mean uh, Meta, link, uh, LinkedIn and um, uh, match.com. I know that there there is interest in making their space safer. We just need to cooperate with them and see how we can continue to 
continually work on that to to uh, to stop enabling access to our victims. And the laundering networks, I think there's a lot of work that could be done there with people who have a great tracing skills who can figure out how this money is being moved around the world and how we can put a stop to it. Last slide. So uh, this is me and that's my email address. And if you are law, active law enforcement and you would be part, like to be part of this coalition, I would love to have you. I um, I talk a lot on LinkedIn about pig butchering and um, and online fraud, and I am always grateful to to comments and people who are interested in the work I'm doing, and and I really appreciate the overlap with what Gasa is doing. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen. One moment. Uh, Erin, thank you very much. Um, uh, I could not follow the chat. Um, so if you are have any questions to Erin, please feel free to use your chat or, uh, or raise your hand. I'm sure there are questions. And Erin, uh, uh, we're not overlapping. We are, we are reinforcing each other. We're, and I love to yes. chat more on seeing what we can do together. Let me see if the first questions are coming in. One moment. Um, oh, good question about. Please, uh, Aaron. Well, I was going to say I'm looking at a uh, non-US victims to report these scams. That's actually um, sort of a problem I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing quite a bit. I I really um, I uh, people reach out to me from Greece, but from Canada, I know how to place you. Like I, I I'm familiar with Canadian law enforcement and I know how to help. But when it comes to um, some of the international law enforcement, it's really difficult. If I don't have a connection in that crypto coalition, it's really difficult to figure out how to get victims in front of someone who is able to help them. Thank you, Erin. I see also a question from Alexandra. Alexandra, would you mind uh, uh, muting yourself and, and asking the question? Um, sure. Um, I think like, yeah, my main question is is like why engaging with someone sending you a message saying it's the wrong number or when someone knows that they don't know the sender, like why replying on this message in the first place? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I think um, for a lot of people, it's very difficult to understand how this could happen. And it's very difficult for them to understand how how the victims fall for this. But what I can tell you is um, there are a lot of very lonely people and there are a lot of people who are sitting at home and they see this thing about your, you know, your dog needs to be picked up from the vet. And so they respond to it. And then the person will say something really nice after that, like, oh, you have a you have a pretty name. Where, what's your name from or or whatever? And they begin that engagement. It is it is psychologically manipulative. It's not it's not anything that I can really understand very well, except for it. you can catch anybody on a bad day. And often I will talk to people and they'll say, you know what, I had just broken up with my girlfriend or I, I was in the middle of a divorce or whatever. People are vulnerable and people people will respond. And 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 the the evidence shows they are doing it. So it's. Yeah, I'm very empathetic. I mean, uh, I get contacted via LinkedIn nearly every day by a beautiful Asian lady. Um, it must be my looks or I, I don't know, maybe something else, but uh, lots of uh, raised hands. <laughs> Louise, uh, would you mind asking your question? Sure, thank you. Uh, hi, Aaron. Nice to see you. I want to say meet you, but we're not actually meeting, but we've actually exchanged a few messages on LinkedIn, you know, uh, dealing with victims and stuff like that. But uh, I'm with, I work with a crypto exchange, right? And so... One of the issues that we're seeing is, you know, we do direct them to IC3, you know, other their local law enforcement. But, you know, unfortunately, as I'm sure, as you've said, and I'm sure you've seen as well, that, you know, local law enforcement is not usually equipped to deal with these uh, kinds of investigations. So how can we, as like, you know, a member of the public sector uh, in the crypto exchange community, how can we assist uh, the victim and local law enforcement better to be able to to tell them like yes you can do this because unfortunately once you know once the funds leave 
our exchange, for example, and they go to another exchange, there's not a whole lot we can do without the intervention of law enforcement. So I'm kind of wondering, like, what's the best way for us to kind of bridge that gap from public to law enforcement? Yeah, I I'm so empathetic with that problem. I think that is, it's interesting about this pig butchering. There are significant problems that exist, and that is one, what that's one of the top <coughs> ones is how do we get our victim in front of a competent investigator in the shortest time possible? Because we know this right. is a speed game and we know that money's moving. So that was part of the concept behind the crypto coalition, actually, was well, let's get everybody together, let's get everybody talking and and what I've seen happen in the coalition quite a bit is, oh, okay, I have a Wichita victim. Is there anyone from Wichita? Is um, is there anybody who can go interview somebody outside of Dallas? And people are piping up now. There's enough people in that group that there are people nearly everywhere. But but say, okay, so say we get it to Wichita. Do we have anybody in Wichita who knows that who knows what to do with this and who knows what to do with it in a quick enough fashion? So it's a major problem. And what I would say is, is the continued, like continuing to work every day, get up every day and and take a couple steps forward. And um, and I think we'll ultimately get there. It's it's for me frustrating how long everything takes. Right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, one more quick question. Is there any uh, plans to let like members of the public sector into your coalition at some point so that we can kind of bridge that gap? To. You know, that's another funny piece, right? Like <laughs> is is um how do we how do we separate the scammers from from the good guys that are not in law enforcement? And there are plenty of good guys that are not in law enforcement. How can we vet them in some way that they can assist law enforcement who's who's quite frankly not really getting it done as well as we should be right now, right? There's a lot of tracers out there who know what they're doing and could help if we could get if we could bridge that gap. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, that's definitely something that's important to me is how, so no, you're not joining my coalition, but is there <laughs> some way that we can, we can, we can, we can vet people so that we right. can make those connections. Yeah. Thanks definitely. for asking. Thank you. Um, Doug. Look, go uh, ahead, thank, please. Yep. Thank you, Aaron. Um, uh, first of all, this was incredibly informative. I greatly appreciate all the information you brought to this. And and to be quite honest, you you have given me a different perspective to this. Um, I've mentioned that, I don't know, four or five times I've had someone contact me and uh, for obvious scam reason with a random text and a picture. And it's almost always an Asian image, an Asian woman, blah, blah, blah. We know the story. However, what is what I'm now interested in and I would like your feedback on is from my perspective from the daily scam where I'm trying to um, I'm trying to humanize what's happening and to educate people to help them to understand as well as sometimes reaching out and talking to the people involved in the scams. So last night as I said I had uh, someone who reached out to me and my question is um, can you think of how I might actually in trying to reverse this engage with the scammer to try to empathize with what they're experiencing and oh my god are you held captain like last night the woman suddenly started speaking to me in a language that turned out to be Khmer from Cambodia and so I just unblocked her a moment ago as you were talking and sent her a message simply saying um are you being held captive are you forced to do this I don't know if she'll respond but I'm wondering if you have suggestions on what I might have said in that moment of talking with her last night yeah, I, I think um, I, I've known a lot of people who have done just that, what you've done, and sometimes it's successful and sometimes they'll start talking. And we know that, um, you know, that's how we get some of the pictures from inside the compounds. And so um, there are definitely international groups who work in this area. And if you want to catch up with me on LinkedIn later, I could help connect you because that that is what they're doing. There are a lot of people whose whose sole mission is is to try and get these people out and sometimes they're successful and and sometimes less successful thank you thanks for your empathy that's really kind um okio i would like to uh please raise your question um hi everyone uh, can you hear me yes yes okay 
Um, I was asking if there are any coalition members uh, in developing countries, particularly in Africa, uh, because a lot of the African countries have very low value uh, currencies. So um, there's an increasing interest with uh, a lot of citizens seeking uh, alternative means of investments, uh, either in foreign currency or most especially cryptocurrencies. And so they very easily fall victim to it, to such scams as well. Um, so are there any members in such countries that could help? You are asking a really important question. And I think that that makes uh, developing nations in Africa even a much bigger target because they are seeing a value in um, in crypto in in terms of having a stable currency and that's what that's how they will be sold by these masterful scammers so unfortunately i do not know anyone in um i my only african connection is nigeria and south africa but i would be very interested if you could connect me with anyone i i really i mean this is a worldwide problem and it calls for a worldwide solution thank you uh okio and, and thank you aaron for answering uh, two more questions. Uh, uh, Mariano, would you uh, mind muting? Yes. Uh, do you hear me well? I do. Yes. Great. Thank you very much for your exposition. It was great. Uh, well, I, I want I wanted to make a contribution and a question later. Uh, here in Argentina, we call this kind of big butchering scam. We call it pyramidal scam because you, you only have like have a, a base. And then you have the, 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 the guys that try to scam you it tell you that if you try, if you bring more victims, you're going to get to the top and you're going to have more profit. And here in Argentina, it's very similar to what happened in Africa, because in Argentina, we are in a constant economical crisis. So it's very easy to, to, to get scammed because we want we all, all our savings are in dollars or in cryptocurrency. So it's very easy. Uh, so that's how we try to, to investigate. My main question was, here in my state, we have a, a big problem related to uh, the crypto scam investigation and every kind of of, uh, of cyber crime investigation. For example, there was a, a, a bomb threat made months ago, and recently they got to, to the guy that did it, uh, but they took all, six months only to know uh, the, the IP address and the number they use and because they don't have the tools and it, it, it raised a, a, a big uh, discussion here in my state but in other states in Argentina has been solved if, if there is a need of an a specialized prosecutor here in Argentina we have a d different uh, specialized prosecutor that for example you have a cyber crimes prosecutor that specializes only in investigating cyber crimes every kind. Do you think that is something that is needed in, in every country? Because I know that the, the US system is uh, quite different in, in terms of who can uh, prosecute a crime. Yeah, I, I do think that. I, um, I think that, th that this is a specialized business. And I think that what we're, what we're asking our local law enforcement to do is become an expert in a new technology that is completely foreign to them. And I think that's a big ask. Um, and we're asking lawyers to do the same thing. I think that to learn cryptocurrency, it requires a bit of a passion. It's a, there's, there are hurdles you need to jump over. And so I love the idea and favor the idea in the United States of creating regional centers. We have regional fusion centers that already exist. What if we embedded into that cryptocurrency tracers and perhaps a specialized um, prosecutor? I can tell you on the federal side, they definitely are doing this in terms of they have a very specialized team, the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team, and um, and they're doing their best to do it across the country. But as great as the federal federal prosecutors are, they're not generally interested in these smaller cases that I'm seeing. And so that's why I think we really need specialists who can do this. This is different from auto theft. It's different from sexual assault. It's different from all those other cases. This is a, this is a whole new uh, technology that people need to spend time learning and understanding. You're on Thank mute. You
Beginner mistake. My apologies. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Marianne. Uh, Jamie, last question to you before we wrap up. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my question is regarding the freezing of the funds and um, uh, doing uh, things with crypto exchanges. Do you like have best practices gathered in the crypto coalition about different um, different exchanges? Because uh, Binance is easy. I wish every company would be like Binance. They're so helpful. Hail to hail to them. It's really easy you mentioned coinbase also <laughs> they're easy also but i cannot say the same for many other ones and it's when you say it's difficult to uh, learn the crypto it's equally difficult to learn to um, maneuver in the international uh, scene with the crypto exchanges and it's it's the biggest obstacle obstacle we see because we have the we have the capability of tracking the funds, but it ends to the crypto exchanges, and that's the main obstacle that we have. So, does the crypto coalition have any help in that sense? And well, thank you for your work and for your presentation. It was excellent. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, yes, you should definitely join my crypto coalition because th this is an issue that we discuss all the time. Um, does anybody have a connection at MEXC? Is OKX compatible? Are they working? Um, and so we we spend a lot of time on uh, communicating among ourselves on who is um, who is cooperating well with law enforcement. And so um, I agree that that is a barrier that when you don't have uh, when you don't have exchanges that want to be cooperative, that becomes the end of that road. So um, I I would love for you to join. And that's something that we share knowledge on all the time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Erin. Um, uh, maybe Erin, if that's OK with you, if you wouldn't mind sharing your email address in the chat, if you haven't sure. already done so, that people can uh, contact you. Um, we are running out of time, but I, Aaron, I really, really, and also I think you, you get a lot of hearts like this in the chat. Uh, oh, good. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for, for your presentation. It was very, very insightful, um, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot more emails and questions. Um, uh, to, I would like to conclude. Um, um, as many of you know, we are organizing the Global Anti-Scam Summit on the 18th and 19th of October. You're all very much invited. Um, uh, feel, feel uh, free to register. You can join virtually or you can join physically. Uh, physically, uh, virtual is free and physically is also free if you use our Friends of Gaza discount code. Um, also, please feel free to share the summit with uh, like-minded persons who you think should be there. We expect about 250 people uh, attending physically, 1,000 virtually uh, from over 70 countries. And I really hope you will be there uh, to together with us define concrete solutions to fight scammers better and Aaron again thank you very much for all your work you're doing and um, with that I also would like to uh, thank all the participants for attending I wish you a very good morning very good afternoon or a very good evening and I hope to see you again next week for our next meetup thank you very much all and uh, uh, again one last time uh, a big applause for Aaron thank you very much <laughs>